arm yourselves with pikes and scythes, with long guns. Mr. Milligan prays that he be freed from military custody and imprisonment and turned over to the proper civil commission. There's large girders going up and Young pointed to them and said, that's where I want you to put the shot, right in there. Raise hell out of that. Were other children on your block attending School 21? Yes. Were these children black or white? White. The Indianapolis public schools operate a segregated school system wherein segregation was imposed and enforced by operation of laws. For over two centuries, the federal courts in Indiana have dealt with cases involving significant legal, political, and social issues. Three of these cases reveal some of the effects that the federal justice system has on the lives of Hoosiers and all Americans. Before becoming a state, Indiana was part of the Northwest Territory. The judicial power of the United States was first established in the territory by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which provided for a federal territorial court located in the capital, Vincennes. In May of 1800, Congress separated most of the Northwest Territory west of the present state of Ohio and called it the Indiana Territory. Vincennes remained the capital until 1813 when it and the territorial court moved to Corridon. On December 11, 1816, Indiana was admitted as the 19th state and the territorial court was dismissed. The U.S. Congress established the first United States District Court for the District of Indiana on March 3, 1817. Two days later, President James Monroe nominated, and the Senate confirmed, Benjamin Park as Indiana's first federal district judge. The court's original order book shows that the court first met on May 5, 1817, in Corydon. This was the court's home for the next eight years. When the state capital moved to Indianapolis in 1825, the U.S. District Court also moved, even though there was no federal courthouse there. The district court conducted its business in the Marion County Courthouse and later at the Indiana Supreme Court courtroom in the new State House. Finally, in 1860, Indiana's first U.S. courthouse and post office was built in downtown Indianapolis. The federal court in Indiana had its own home, just in time for one of America's most important judicial decisions. During the Civil War, most of the fighting occurred in the southern or border states. But there was conflict throughout the state of Indiana about the war. Many people in the North were sympathetic ideologically to what the Southerners were asking for, which was separation and secession. Um, they thought that the U.S. Constitution afforded them that, that right, that power to separate from the Union at their will. At the start of the war, President Lincoln was very concerned about Southern sympathizers undermining the war effort in the North. In 1862, he declared martial law and suspended habeas corpus to keep control over dissent. A writ of habeas corpus is a basic civil liberty dating to the Magna Carta. It orders an official who has a person in custody to bring that prisoner to court and explain why he is being detained. The suspension of these rights meant that the army could arrest, without legal procedure, anyone who it felt was disloyal. It could hold them in prison without a hearing and try and sentence them in a military commission. The military could also carry out the sentence, even if it was death. Indiana Governor Oliver P. Morton, a friend of the president, strongly supported the decision to suspend habeas corpus. So Morton worked very closely with the army and, and commanders in Indiana to uh, uncover conspiracy and to keep tabs on the conspirators in Indiana. In Huntington County, Indiana, there was wide sympathy for the South. 
secret organizations like the Sons of Liberty opposed the war and encouraged draft resistance, desertion, and even armed revolution. Lambden P. Milligan was one of those persons. He was a lawyer and a farmer in Huntington, Indiana, and since the 1840s, he had been a pro-slavery defender of the South. Milligan was uh, a leader of the Sons of Liberty organization, which was in contact with Confederate agents who were aiming to subvert the war effort in the Midwest. In his speeches, Milligan encouraged people to rise up in arms against the government. Daylight. Let liberty be your watchword and let it resound from every stump in Indiana. <laughs> Organize and arm yourselves with pikes and scythes, with long guns. Arm yourselves as best you can for the fight for liberty. Amen. Some will perish in the conflict. But I, for one, would rather be snuffed out in the blaze of a glorious battle for right than to linger a little longer in the scintillations of expiring liberty. Yes. Military spies attended the events and eventually identified him as one of Indiana's leading conspirators. On October 5, 1864, soldiers arrested Milligan and put him in a military stockade at Camp Morton. He was soon tried by a military commission and found guilty of inciting insurrection and giving aid and comfort to the enemy and sentenced to be hanged on May 19, 1865. Milligan's attorney, Joseph Ewing MacDonald, quickly petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus from the United States Circuit Court for the District of Indiana in Indianapolis. Congress had established this court in 1837. The district judge and a U.S. Supreme Court justice heard cases on the circuit court together. His case would be heard in the federal court because it involved a United States constitutional issue. The hearing was not to decide his guilt or innocence of criminal charges, but to determine if he had been tried in the proper court. There would be no spectators and no jury. Milligan's fate would be determined by two judges. His scheduled execution was just nine days away. One judge involved in the case was David McDonald, the newly appointed federal district judge for the Indiana District. The other was United States Supreme Court Justice David Davis. All rise. Oh yay, oh yay. On this 10th day of May in the year 1865, the United States Circuit Court for the District of Indiana is now in session. You may now be seated. The first matter on the docket is case number 684 in the matter of Lambden P. Milligan. All those present for Mr. Milligan, please step forward now and present your case. May it please the court. I am Joseph McDonald, and it is my privilege to represent Lambden P. Milligan. Mr. Milligan respectfully represents to you that his court-martial is a travesty of such significance, it threatens the freedom of all citizens of our great nation. Mr. Milligan questions the jurisdictional authority of the military commission that entered court-martial number 214. He was not serving in the military of the United States, nor was he a prisoner of war, nor a resident of one of the rebellious states. To enter an order of death by hanging after a trial by a military commission without any civil court intervention is a violation of Mr. Milligan's constitutional rights. Mr. Milligan prays that he be freed from military custody and imprisonment and turned over to the proper civil commission. Earlier this year, I met with President Lincoln on my client's behalf. He reviewed the order of the Military Commission and suggested certain errors and imperfections in the record. Although the President did not opine as to the guilt or innocence of Mr. Milligan, I believe it was his intent to disapprove the final order of General Hovey. And I ask you now to carry through with President Lincoln's intention to do what he did not accomplish before his death. Grant Lambden P. Milligan 
freedom from his military captors, and afford him his guaranteed due process rights, the right to have his actions considered by a grand jury. Thank you, gentlemen, and Godspeed. Thank you, Counselor. This court is adjourned and will reconvene in one hour. Well, Justice Davis, we have an interesting situation, don't we? Indeed, we do. It seems clear that a gross injustice has been committed against Mr. Milligan. I agree. But if we grant a writ of habeas corpus, it's likely that General Hovey will ignore our ruling and hang Milligan anyway. Ignoring civil courts, that's their record. Both of us agree that if the Supreme Court heard the case, the military would probably not immediately hang Milligan. They would wait to hear the court's decision. True. I believe the basic issue in this situation is that the military court had no constitutional jurisdiction to try Milligan. He should have been tried in a civilian court. Now, of course, if we were to disagree on this, we could send the case to the Supreme Court for their decision. That is our best course. The decision should be made there. At that time, if the two judges disagreed on a decision, the case was sent to the Supreme Court. This court, being equally divided, on motion of Milligan by counsel, it is ordered that said petition, together with the following question, be certified to the Supreme Court of the United States for its decision. Whether upon the facts stated in the petition, the military commission had jurisdiction legally to try and sentence Milligan. So ordered this 10th day of May, 1865. Court is now adjourned. Milligan remained in custody, and opening arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court began on March 6, 1866, nearly a year after the end of the Civil War. On the issue of habeas corpus, the court unanimously decided in favor of Milligan. They ruled that suspending the writ of habeas corpus and trying civilians in a military court when there were civilian courts open and operating, violated the Constitution. Justice Davis wrote, The Constitution of the United States is a law for rulers and people, equally in war and in peace, and covers with the shield of its protection all classes of men, at all times, and under all circumstances. Civil liberty and martial law cannot endure together. In the conflict, one or the other must perish. Milligan gets re is released from uh, prison in April of 1866, and he is a bitter man. Decades later, he portrayed himself as a martyr for free speech and civil liberties. And he wasn't. He was a conspirator. He was, if you will, a traitor. And he was simply tried in the wrong court. Ex parte Milligan is settled law. It stands as a judicial landmark decision because the case was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. And it went to the Supreme Court because of the wisdom demonstrated by Justice Davis and Judge McDonald at the U.S. Circuit Court for the District of Indiana. The economic growth and expansion of the state population after the war meant an increasing caseload for all federal courts. In the 1870s and 80s, federal buildings were constructed in Evansville, New Albany, and Fort Wayne, but a lone judge still had to travel to each city 
Also, in 1891, Congress created a new series of courts, the United States Courts of Appeals. These courts were created in an effort to expedite cases that had been appealed from the district and circuit courts and to relieve the caseload of the Supreme Court where most appeals had previously been heard. Appeals from the federal district courts in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin were heard by the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit headquartered in Chicago. In September 1905, a new federal courthouse and post office opened in Indianapolis. The courthouse and post office was built during a time of dynamic changes in labor practices and the expansive growth of the steel and iron industries. It was a perfect environment for unions to form and flex their collective muscles. The conditions and rights that unions were fighting for, uh, first and foremost, had to do with better hours, better wages, better working conditions. One of those early unions was the International Association of Bridge and Structural Iron Workers, organized in 1896. The iron workers were headquartered in Indianapolis, in the American Central Life Insurance Building on Monument Circle. So the iron workers were after always uh, that work be completed under union conditions by union members under what was called a union shop setup, um, sometimes called a closed shop. But the employers were after an open shop, meaning they wanted to have complete control over who they hired and when. In 1903, the United States Steel Company and 40 other manufacturers created the National Erectors Association they conducted a public campaign to undermine the advances that the iron workers and other unions were making. The National Erectors Association paid strike breakers, hired non-union workers, and bribed union officials. Workers sabotaged tools, equipment, and construction projects. Unions called for strikes to cripple construction jobs. Beatings occurred on both sides. For the iron workers, it was not a far leap to bombings meant to damage or destroy work done by non-union laborers. They felt this was the best way to undermine the open shop. So the iron workers, using dynamite and nitroglycerin, began a covert nationwide bombing campaign in December 1906. It continued for five years, resulting in over 100 explosions of bridges, buildings, construction materials, and equipment. No one was arrested. But some newspapers and the public had decided who was guilty. In the early morning hours of Saturday, October 1st, 1910, over 100 employees of the Los Angeles Times, whose owner had publicly condemned unions, were at work. At 1.07 a.m., an explosion rocked the building, collapsing half of it and sparking fires. The bomb included 16 sticks of dynamite and a large can of nitroglycerin, and a specially built alarm clock. It was set to go off at 4 a.m. at a time when the building should have been empty, but the timer was faulty. As a result, 21 people were killed. Newspapers called it the crime of the century. Meanwhile, bombings continued in the Midwest and California. After intense surveillance, key suspects were identified. John J. McNamara, better known as Joe, Secretary Treasurer of the Iron Workers, his brother James B. McNamara, and union member Ordy McManigal. Also implicated were Herbert Hawken, a member of the Iron Workers Executive Board, and Frank Ryan, president of the union. In April 1911, James McNamara and McManigal were in Detroit on yet another bombing job. By this time, authorities had enough evidence and arrested them both. In their suitcases, the police found revolvers, a rifle outfitted with a silencer, six clock batteries, blasting caps, wires, and other materials. And McNamara had a satchel stained with nitroglycerin.
John McNamara was arrested in Indianapolis, and all three were extradited to California. In many criminal conspiracies, there is a weak link. In this one, it was McManigal. He told Hawken, I want to tell you this. Anytime I'm caught, you're all caught. I will spill the story as fast as I can once I feel the irons on my wrists. Events in California moved quickly. McManigal became a government witness and was not charged at this point. James and John McNamara were tried on multiple charges relating to the Times explosion and other California attacks. McManigal's testimony and the physical evidence convinced the brothers to plead guilty. James was sentenced to life, and John received 15 years, both in San Quentin prison. Meanwhile, back in Indianapolis, the police searched the union's headquarters on Monument Circle. In a basement vault, they found about 80 pounds of dynamite, nitroglycerin, and other bomb-making components. It was, as the press put it, enough to blow up Monument Circle. There were also large boxes of letters and other correspondence that would prove to be devastating in court. The federal government wanted to make an example of the Iron Workers Union, so a federal grand jury was convened in Indianapolis in late 1911. In February 1912, the grand jury brought 32 indictments against 54 men. They were charged with conspiracy to commit a crime against the United States by transporting explosives on passenger trains from one state into another. Because these crimes took place across state lines, it was a federal offense. The trial was prosecuted in Indianapolis because that's where the Union's national headquarters was and where the conspirators stored the explosives. The trial began on October 1st, 1912, with Judge Albert Barnes Anderson presiding. The jury consisted of 10 farmers, a grocer, and a grain dealer, Hoosiers all. Because of the intense publicity and for other reasons, Judge Anderson ordered the jurors sequestered under guard in the courthouse for the duration of the trial. They spent the next three months living in quarters on the fourth floor. In total disregard of the law. Opening statements took over a week by each side before testimony finally began. Prosecutor Miller called his star witness, Ordy McManigal. Do you remember the first job you did? Oh yeah, it was June of 1907. I was working on the Ford building in Detroit. Hawken came to me and said the union wanted to clean out the open shop there and I was the man to do it because I had worked in stone quarries and knew how to use explosives. Uh, I said I didn't want to do it, but he said if I didn't do it, I was boycotted against getting a job anywhere. Uh, and it said it paid $125. Would you please point out Mr. Hawken in this courtroom? Thank you. There was also a job in Boston? That's right. Who were your contacts for this job? There was Mike Young, Frank Webb, Frank Ryan, and Jim Cooper. Let the record show that the witness has identified four defendants, all of whom are union officers. How'd the job go? Well, I left Chicago at 3 a.m. carrying 50 pounds of dynamite cap some fuse. I used four different train lines and arrived in Boston the next morning and checked the package of dynamite at the railway station. I then met Mike Young at the labor hall and told him I understood he had some work needed to be looked after. Uh, the opera house, I believed. He said, that's right. Let's take a streetcar ride. And we got off the car and walked to the job. There was, there was a large girders going up and Young pointed to them and said, that's where I want you to put the shot, right in there. Raise hell out of that. So, that night, I put 25 pounds of dynamite at the spot, lit the 50-foot fuse. Explosion happened 30 minutes later. I stayed in Boston that night. You met with Mr. Hawken mid-July 1909? Yes, I did. What did you discuss? Well, 
he says, I have a new invention. I've made some improvements on the old way of doing business. We've got the real soup now. I says, what do you mean, soup? Nitroglycerin. I says, is that so? Uh, I've heard about it, but I've never seen any of it. What's the invention? He says, oh, it's a clock device with a battery that gives you plenty of time to get away. Gives you a good alibi. So is this the device that you used for other jobs? That's right. It was more reliable and easier to carry. Uh, sometimes dynamite wouldn't go off because of a bad fuse, or especially if it was froze. One time I brought some of the stuff home to thaw out, put it on the radiator. Next thing I knew, my little girl was playing with it. McManigal was on the stand for five days, and his perfect recall of 23 explosions was amazing. But equally powerful evidence appeared in more than 500 incriminating letters written by union officials taken from the safe at the iron workers' headquarters. Day after day, Prosecutor Miller read every one of them to the jury and into the record. Gentlemen, not all of these letters refer to plain and obvious terms of dynamiting and other forms of violence, but they have a very clear and incriminating significance. Ed Clark wrote from Cincinnati, we are going to do something to the Granger Company. Joe, being so well known here, I do not think it is advisable for me to buy any explosive. Could there be such a thing as you sending me from Indianapolis what I need? Hmm. It was very direct letters like this that caused Joe McNamara to tell certain members be more careful what you write to headquarters, for the Lord only knows who reads the mail that comes into this office. Our people should be careful what they put on paper. It took weeks for Miller to present his case. On November 30th... Your Honor, the prosecution rests. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Harding, are you prepared to proceed? We are, Your Honor. We call Frank Ryan to the stand. The defense's case primarily attempted to discredit the government's claims and having defendants take the stand to deny their guilt. Judge Anderson did not permit the defense to introduce evidence of employer mistreatment, nor evidence of the possible reasons for the actions of the union members. Mr. Ryan, what do you know about any payments for dynamiting? I can say that I, as union president, nor any other member of the executive board, knew of any money spent by J.J. McNamara for dynamiting. What would you say about the letters concerning job assignments read by Mr. Miller? Well, all the letters sent by me to our agents in various cities referred only to replace non-union workers with union men. That was it. What about the explosives found in union headquarters? I never visited the dynamite laboratory in the basement. In his cross-examination of Ryan, Miller hit hard at Ryan's letter to union officials. What did you mean in your letters asking union officials to take care of jobs? I meant they were to use every legitimate means to put union men to work. Well, the problem with that explanation is that explosions often followed the letters. Does that seem odd to you? No. On December 17th, both sides rested their cases. Mr. Miller, your closing argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Gentlemen of the jury, this is the most important trial of recent years. A conspiracy more dastardly and more threatening to society than the crime of any one individual. Organized crime has here appeared to an amazing degree. Plain assaults became murderous assaults. Criminals became bolder and dynamite and nitroglycerin were resorted to. Had local authorities done their duty, this conspiracy could not have spread. The federal government entered this matter because local authorities failed. 
the Los Angeles Times explosion was called the crime of the century. But the real crime of the century was this damnable conspiracy. It will be an everlasting disgrace to this country and to our civilization if these conspirators are not convicted. Thank you. John Kern led the closing arguments for the defense. Gentlemen of the jury, some of these defendants are uneducated working men, taken from their homes hundreds of miles away, made to face this strange court. Some didn't even understand what they were charged with. I had to explain to them that they were not charged with dynamiting, but with transporting explosives illegally. You cannot convict them of causing explosions. Gentlemen, you have in your hands the liberty of a fellow man. They come from homes where they are loved just as you are in yours. I now leave my clients with all they have, all they love, in your hands. The next day, December 26th, the defendants were marched back into the courthouse. The judge issued the jury its deliberation instructions. In them, he outlined in detail the charges each defendant faced. You are to return a separate verdict for each defendant. On December 28th, the jury returned their verdicts. 38 men were found guilty and two were acquitted. As each name was read by the clerk of the court, some wives broke down and sobbed. Guilty? Jim Cooper. Guilty. A special train, dubbed the Dynamiter Special, took the convicts from Indianapolis to the Fort Leavenworth, Kansas Federal Prison. The defense counsel filed an appeal with the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. For six defendants, the district court's judgment was reversed and sent back to the court for action. The other 24 verdicts were affirmed. And so the dynamite conspiracy was not just somebody blowing something up, although as terrible as it is, it's a reflection of this class warfare that's going on in this time period between employers and uh, labor unions and the workers they represent. Judge Anderson continued to serve as the only district judge in Indiana until he was elevated to the Seventh Circuit on January 6, 1925. Robert Baltzell was appointed to Anderson's vacated seat by President Coolidge. He was confirmed by the U.S. Senate on January 13, 1925. At the same time, Congress also approved a second district judgeship for the state. In February 1925, Thomas Slick was appointed by the president to this position. In 1928, Congress divided the Indiana Federal Court into the Northern District and the Southern District. The Northern District was headquartered in Fort Wayne and the Southern District remained in Indianapolis. William E. Steckler was appointed to replace Judge Baltzell upon Baltzell's death in 1950. This was followed by a period of significant change for the Southern District Court. Four additional judgeships were added between 1954 and 1979. On the horizon stood a court case that would take decades to resolve. We were kids and we were suddenly thrown into this big adult legal situation. In 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case titled Plessy v. Ferguson, ruled that public racially separate facilities, including schools, did not violate the Constitution if the facilities were equal. This is called the separate but equal doctrine. Many states, including Indiana, used this decision to keep schools segregated for decades. 
In 1949, the Indiana General Assembly passed a law requiring the state to begin the gradual integration of schools. In 1954, the United States Supreme Court held in the Brown versus the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education decision that separate but equal had no place in schools. Segregation supported by law was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Ten years later, the U.S. Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It gave the U.S. Department of Justice the authority to sue school districts that failed to comply with the law. Parents could complain in writing to the U.S. Attorney General that their children were being deprived of equal protection of the laws. If the Justice Department agreed, the school corporation was told to correct the condition. If it did not, the Civil Rights Act authorized the Justice Department to bring a civil suit to federal district court. In 1967, the Buckley family, with the support of the NAACP, filed a complaint with the Department of Justice challenging the segregated school system in Indianapolis. The DOJ investigated and notified the IPS school board that it would file suit against the board unless it took corrective action by May 1968. IPS responded by proposing only a voluntary transfer of teachers. This was not acceptable. So the DOJ filed suit to force the desegregation of schools. There was hope that a trial could be avoided, so both sides attempted to negotiate a settlement. The discussions were mediated by United States District Judge S. Hugh Dillon. Some compromises and efforts were made by the IPS board, but the talks failed. IPS argued that the individual preferences of where people choose to live leads to separation. This is called de facto segregation and is not illegal. The U.S. Justice Department believed that IPS practiced de jure segregation, separation enforced by law, which is illegal. At about the same time, the Indiana State Legislature passed an act that consolidated the governments of Indianapolis and the surrounding townships in Marion County. It was known as Unigov. There would be one mayor, one city council, and shared municipal services for the area covered by Unigov but the act expressly said that school corporations would not be affected. The violation trial associated with the suit filed by the Department of Justice began in Judge Dillon's courtroom on July 12, 1971. You may be seated. Is the plaintiff ready for trial? Yes, Your Honor. All right, do you wish to make an opening statement? Your Honor, with your permission, I'd like to use the rostrum. Go ahead, just make yourself at home. Thank you. May it please the court. The United States brought this action under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, seeking to enforce the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution against the Board of School Commissioners of Indianapolis. The evidence in this case will show the concentration of black students and faculty members in a few schools is not the result of a fortuitous combination of circumstances. The evidence will show that this situation is the direct and inevitable result of conscious policy decisions by the board and its employees. The Justice Department argued that the IPS policy decisions were established years before this trial. This was illustrated by one of the government's witnesses, Arthur Boone a parent who had children enrolled in IPS during the 1950s. Did you ever have occasion to seek to transfer your children from School 64? In September 1952, I decided to transfer my children out of 64 to 21. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Why did you seek a transfer? Well, 64 was an old dilapidated building, a fire trap on top of that and I decided my children could get a better education if they went to a better school. Also, for safety reasons, 21 was closer. They could walk there safely. Walking to 64 meant they had to walk about a mile around a railroad or across an unguarded crossing. 
Were other children on your block attending School 21? Yes. Were these children black or white? White. How did you go about seeking the transfer? Well, I went to the school to enroll my children. Other parents were there and they were directed to the room where they should enroll their children. I was directed to the principal's office. What happened there? Well, I asked him to enroll my children and he hesitated. He said that first he had to determine the boundaries and he came back with the answer that we weren't in the district. I asked how did he determine that and he said that the district didn't include my address. Did you tell him other children on your block attended School 21? I did. And he said if I wanted to take things further, I would have to go down to the school board and see a Mr. Miller. I went down, and I waited in the ante room for quite a while, and I finally saw him. And he gave me the same answer as I got from the principal. What happened then, Mr. Boone? I hired a lawyer, and I decided to file a lawsuit. Mr. Boone's problem was in 1952. Nearly 20 years later, things had not changed much. No, I don't I remember any changes in 90. Uh, it was across 16th Street. After hearing from dozens of witnesses and 1,400 pages of testimony, Judge Dillon issued his decision. He found that IPS had not desegregated after the 1949 state law, the 1954 Brown decision, or the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The Indianapolis Public Schools operate a segregated school system wherein segregation was imposed and enforced by operation of laws. For example, school boundaries have been redrawn 360 times since 1954, and 90% of the changes had the effect of increasing racial segregation. Well, the board is clearly charged with the affirmative duty to take whatever steps might be necessary to convert to a unitary system in which racial discrimination will be eliminated, root and branch. Judge Dillon ordered IPS to make changes to stabilize the racial balance and prevent further segregation. These changes affected Tanya Hardy Brown. We grew up in the Butler Tarkington area we were just north of 38th Street. Uh, it was a quiet, family-oriented neighborhood. At that time, the neighborhood was transitioning from all white to all African American. I expected to attend Shortridge High School. I was excited. I had wanted to be a cheerleader, so I hung out with a couple of the um, neighborhood teenagers, the girls, and learn the school song and some of the cheers and things like that. My parents received a letter from the Indianapolis Public School Board that explained the busing situation and said that I was going to be attending another high school as opposed to Shortridge High School. So I wound up at, at Broad Ripple High School. I went from being a Short Ridge Blue Devil to being a, a Ripple Rocket. <laughs> when my parents told me that I would be attending Broad Ripple as opposed to Short Ridge, um, I cried. I cried because I wasn't going to be with the same friends that I had always had. So everything changed we didn't have any concept of the reason why we were being sent to another school. We just knew that we were being sent to a school we didn't want to go to. The other students, some of them treated us as very fair and were very welcoming. Some of them made it known to us that they really weren't happy about us being there. Uh, it was a 40 minute bus ride from our house. Initially, they had no real plan for getting us to and from school other than to put us on a bus at seven o'clock in the morning to get us there, and again at three o'clock in the afternoon to get us home. There was no second morning bus. Um, there was no after school or activity bus. It was difficult um, initially. Some of the white students did not want us 
to join the cheerleading squad and, and we wanted to be cheerleaders. As a compromise, we were allowed to be on the pom-pom squad. And as pom-pom girls, we became a more popular attraction than the cheerleaders did because we did dance routines to modern music like the Jackson 5 and James Brown and Sly and the Family Stone. The cheerleaders just did cheers. I would like to think that it taught me to be more tolerant of others and more understanding. It um, taught me to be open to new and different experiences. Judge Dillon's final remedy in the 1971 case was based on testimony related to the so-called tipping factor presented in the violation trial. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I know that one of your studies uh, states that, uh, <clears throat> quote, a Negro enrollment of over 40% creates a faster exodus of white pupils. <clears throat> what other observations have you made with regard to that so-called critical percentage that's more or less than that? It hangs around 40. It varies on the history and traditions of the community. At around 40%, Caucasians say, well, that's a black school, and move away, irreversibly, from that neighborhood. At that time, IPS was 38% black. And there were debates about whether the tipping point was 40% or 20%, the, the lower the better. Um, but IPS was on its way to 40% black students. So if Dylan was going to avoid, avoid this tipping factor, he needed to bust the kids out of IPS to the suburban school system. As a result of Dylan's order in the 1971 violation trial, school corporations inside and outside of Marion County as well as the state of Indiana were added as defendants. At the time, higher courts had not indicated if an inter-district remedy was even legal. Two weeks after Dillon's decision, the IPS school board appealed. In February 1973, the 7th Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the judge's finding of illegal de jure segregation and his decision for further litigation involving the suburban schools and state officials. On June 25, 1973, the Supreme Court refused to hear appeals of this decision, thus allowing Dillon's rulings to stand. On July 20, 1973, he ordered one-way reassignment, including busing, of some IPS students to surrounding suburban school systems, some outside Marion County. He delayed this action for one year in the hope that IPS would take the initiative to desegregate itself. It did not. There's probably no more highly emotional topic than schools. Uh, there was intense public pressure on the judge. It got so intense, the judge had 24-hour United States Marshal protection. There had been a number of death threats. People would call the office threatening to kill him. During the same period that the IPS case was working through Judge Dillon's court, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in a similar case concerning the Detroit schools. It was called Milliken versus Bradley. Based on this Detroit decision by the Supreme Court, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals ordered that the 13 non-Marion County school systems named as defendants by Dillon be dismissed from the litigation in the Indianapolis case. It then sent the IPS case back to Dillon to determine whether Unigo boundaries without like IPS boundaries warrants an interdistrict remedy. A second trial to find an acceptable remedy began on March 18, 1975. The trial included testimony about the role of public housing patterns in school racial makeup, but the primary focus was Unigov. So what Dillon did was in 1975, in July of 1975, he had an evidentiary hearing to determine whether or not Unigov had an impact that would justify a cross-district remedy. That was actually carried on by uh, two black attorneys, John Moss and John Ward, who represented black plaintiffs, the Buckley plaintiffs. And the suburban school systems all had their own separate attorneys, so you're talking about 20 attorneys aligned on one side against these two. So there's quite a David and Goliath fight going on there.
Plaintiff witnesses were called by attorneys Moss and Ward to prove that because UNIGOV did not expand IPS school boundaries to match changes in other governmental boundaries, the law contributed to racially segregate IPS schools. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you tell the court your name, please? Yes, Ray Crow. Did you serve on any committees during the 1969 session of the Indiana General Assembly? Well, yes, I did on the Education Committee on Affairs of Marion County. Did the committee consider legislation that is now known as UNIGO? Yes, we did. Do you recall if there was any input from the uh, Department of Public Instructions as to the impact that UNIGO might have on schools in Marion County? There was none. Well, there was some input from representatives from school corporations located in Marion County. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You may examine. Mr. Crow, could you please describe what this input consisted of? Objection, Your Honor. The school town of Speedway objects to any conversations between this witness and anyone else with respect to the enactment of UNIGOV legislation. <clears throat> I'm going to overrule that objection. You may answer. Thank you, Judge. There were representatives from school corporations who objected to the schools all being involved in one school system. What is your recollection of the reasons why they didn't want the schools to be involved? Objected in to on behalf of Franklin Township as hearsay, Your Honor. Overruled. You may answer. I think that the school system preferred to be independent and carry on with their systems as they were at that time. To your recollection, was race ever given as a reason for the unwillingness to be a part of one system in Marion County? Objected to as hearsay. Overruled. I am positive that race did not enter into the discussion or reasons whatsoever. Uh, Mr. Ward, are you ready? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, can you please say your name, please? My name is Charles Whistler. And did you have any part in the planning or drafting of the UNIGOV legislation? I did. In 1968, I served on a committee that formulated the outlines of the legislation. Later, I was one of the attorneys that participated in drafting the bill. Well, can you tell us, Mr. Whistler, in your opinion, why IPS schools were not included in the legislation? I think it was because they were independent of civil government. The people had worked hard to get their schools reorganized, built and developed, and they were proud of them. And they didn't want schools to be involved in any way, shape or form with UNIGOV. So that's why schools were specifically excluded in the bill? Yes. That section of the bill was only included to provide absolute clarity. In my opinion, even if that section had not been included, the school still would not have been affected by UNIGOV. UNIGOV gave him the justification for sending the black kids to the suburban school systems within Marion County. His dominant thought is that all I need to establish is that UNIGOV had a segregative effect. His second remedy decision was announced on August 1st, 1975. When the General Assembly expressly eliminated the schools from consideration under UNIGOV, it signaled its lack of concern with the whole problem and thus inhibiting desegregation within IPS. The establishment of the UNIGOV boundaries warrants a limited inter-district remedy within all of Marion County. So this decision of Dillon's was then appealed up to the Seventh Circuit in 1976. Judge Dillon's decision was upheld by the Seventh Circuit, but the decision was then appealed up to the United States Supreme Court. Before the Supreme Court could make a determination on the Indianapolis case, it decided another case called Arlington Heights. It's in the Arlington Heights case where the Supreme Court definitively says that violations of the Equal Protection Clause require discriminatory intent 
not just discriminatory impact. So the Supreme Court remanded the Indianapolis case back down to the lower courts for determination of whether or not Unigov was motivated by discriminatory intent. Judge Dillon began to look for evidence of discriminatory intent embedded in Unigov. He searched through the court trial materials from the past nine years, spending days going over thousands of pages of testimony and exhibits. If he doesn't find the existence of discriminatory intent, he does not have a justification for cross-district busing. Dillon makes a ruling in 1978 that the passage of Unigov was motivated by discriminatory intent. In this ruling is when the cross-district remedy really attains definitive legal status. There were still three years of additional appeals, but the Seventh Circuit continually upheld Dillon's decisions, and the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear any further appeals. The interdistrict remedy was finally implemented in 1981, more than 14 years after the Justice Department had filed suit. Buses to the suburban schools rolled in September, with about 7,000 African-American students involved in one-way busing. Sixteen years later, in January of 1997, IPS requested that Judge Dillon lift the busing order. Instead, he ruled that his 1981 order would not be lifted, but would be, quote, continuing and permanent. IPS appealed this decision to the Seventh Circuit. They ruled that the 1981 busing order was never meant to be permanent. The Seventh Circuit really based its decision on the notion that at some point in time, local institutions needed to be returned to local control. That time came in 1998 when Judge Dillon declared, IPS has achieved unitary status within the meaning of the Supreme Court's decision. This agreement relative to the phasing out of mandatory transfer of IPS resident students is ratified and approved. Unitary means that the school is now operating a school system free of racial discrimination. It's no longer operating a dual school system in which it was treating black students and white students differently. Dillon ordered that the gradual phasing out of busing in Marion County would start in five years, or once a township school system had reached a 15% black population. So like Lawrence and Warren that I represented was already at 15%. So that started immediately for them. But for other school districts, it didn't start for another five years. And that's why it took 18 years for the order to eventually wear itself out. When people were denied equal opportunity because of their race, the federal courts were available to remedy those unlawful and unconstitutional conditions. It did turn out to be um, a very good thing. Um, otherwise, we would have just continued on you know, blacks at this school, whites at this school, never the two shall meet. And what he thought was right was desegregating that school system uh, as a way to provide those black kids with equal educational opportunity. Now, because there weren't legal precedent, he had to make the decision himself. So he was the one who was creating the precedent. Indianapolis should be proud to have had a judge like that sitting on the court, especially for a case like this. For over 200 years, the United States District Court for Indiana, and later the Southern District Court of Indiana, has made its mark on the nation's judicial landscape. The judges were all male until President Reagan appointed the first female, Sarah Evans Barker, in 1984. The first African-American judge, Tanya Walton Pratt, was appointed by President Barack Obama in 2010. The current court has addressed such complex public issues as obscenity, school prayer, excessive use of force, prison conditions, voting rights, government corruption, ownership of international art antiquities, and the right of a child with AIDS to attend public school. The court is an important part of the fabric of Indiana life. 
Its power, impartiality, and independence promote the core American values of freedom, equality, and justice.